Medicine Walk by Ojibwe Canadian author Richard Wagamese is the story of a father-son struggle that finds peace in the mountainous landscape of British Columbia. It is about the journey, both spiritual and physical, that 16-year-old Franklin Starlight makes with his dying alcoholic father, Eldon. Eldon has been absent from Franklin for most of his life, but at the end of his days, summons Franklin to accompany him to his final resting place in the rugged back country of the BC interior. This is a profoundly moving novel that exhibits the beauty in the kind of mountain fiction that's not about the reaching of summits, but about guiding us home. Medicine Walk is a text that doesn't describe mountains in detail, but has their force echo throughout the story conspicuously. In this passage, Eldon meets Franklin in a rundown inn after years of absence, neglect, and drinking. The place was a dank hovel. It had the look of an old garage or warehouse, a low-slung one-story joint that hadn't seen paint in years. There was a hand-painted sign under a lone spotlight on a rickety pole held in place by guy wires run to the roof. The sign said, Charlie's. The windows were swing-outs, and one of them was held open by a broomstick. Sounds from a jukebox, and the garble of voices and the clink of glasses. And when they stepped through the door, the kids saw a plywood bar set up on old barrels and mismatched tables and chairs strewn haphazardly about the room. The lights were dim, giving the faces that turned to look them over a pall as if they were shrouded by shadow, and the talk lowered. As the kid followed his father across the room, the weight of their eyes on him was like the feeling of being watched by something unseen on a mountain trail. His father strode through the room, merely flicking a wrist in greeting to those who spoke to him, and opened a door at the far end and stepped out onto a deck. It was suspended over the dark push of the river by huge pilings, and the kid could hear the hiss and gurgle of it from beneath the boards. There were propane heaters set around, and there were knots of men at the tables. His father walked to an empty table close to the railing and hauled a chair back, and sat looking out over the water. The kid shook his head, and when his father still did not speak, he took his makings out and began to twist a smoke. He drummed his fingers on the table. After a moment, he lit up and took a draw and looked out at the river streaming past like a long black train. When he turned back, he saw a tall gangly man step through the door with a bottle on a tray and walk quickly to their table, set the bottle down, and then stand and look at his father, who continued to look at the river. The kid smirked and put his feet up on the chair across from him. His father opened the bottle and raised it, and took a couple of heavy swallows, and set the bottle down and wiped at his mouth with the back of his hand. The plume from the stack downriver was like a ghostly geyser, and the lights of the mill all orange and hazed like a carnival lot. On the far shore, the town disappeared into the shadows thrown by the dim run of lights along the thin streets. The line of mountain was a black seam above it all. The man returned with coffee. The kid drank and waited, feeling angry and impatient. His father was silent. For a while, there was only the garrulous talk of the men in the background, the high arch of a fiddle on the juke, and the swish of the river beneath him. The coffee was bitter and hot, and he cradled the cup in his palms and watched his father. So how come they call you Twinkles? he asked. It's bullshit, 
What? Starlight. Twinkle, twinkle, you get it. Yeah, but you ain't, ain't exactly the twinkly sort. What am I then? How in hell would I know? Cloudy, I guess. His father shook his head and took another drink, smaller, more deliberate. How I feel, I suppose. You fixing to die? Jesus, how'd you get so hard-assed? Just asking a question. The man brought chicken and beans and a tortilla, and the kid dug into them and ate hungrily while his father watched him and nursed the bottle along. It was good chicken, and he slopped up the beans with the tortilla and washed them down with the coffee. He sat back in his chair. His father stared at him with flat eyes, and for a moment the kid thought he was stone drunk. They sat wordlessly and looked at the river. She cuts right through past the mill, picks up speed, and rolls down into the valley thirty miles or so downstream. You know it. Same valley leads to the old man's. You come up that way, his father said, and pointed at the line of mountain. I know it. I hunted that whole territory, the kid said. She's a good river. I've been on her most of my life, one way or another. Used to be in the old days we'd float log booms down from the falls, mile long some of them booms. Me and a pike pole walking the length of them, keeping them moving right down to here. Then... After a couple of days, we'd head back up and do her all over again, right to freeze up. But that was years ago. You lumberjack? Some. I liked it better on the water, but you had to cut and fall in order to get out there. Got to be a boomer if you worked out well enough. He shook his head slowly. Nowadays, they use trucks. Takes the heart out of it. When was this? Hell, I was young. Your age. Went to work when I was fourteen. So, I guess you called me here to tell me that? His father sipped from the bottle. You get right to it, don't you? Got to. Winter's coming. Stuff needs doing. I gotta ask you a favor. Seems to me you're the one who owes. I do. I know that. Sometimes, though, you got to give to get. I already gave forty. I ain't talking about money. Money's no use in this particular thing. What then? I want you to head into the back country with me. You must be drunker than I thought. I want you to take me out into that territory you come through, the one you hunted all your life. There's a ridge back, forty mile. Sits above a narrow valley with a high range behind it, facing east. I know it. I want you to take me there. Why would you want to go out there in your condition? because I need you to bury me there. The kid sat with his coffee cup half raised to his mouth, and he felt the urge to laugh and stand up and walk out and head back to the old farm. But his father looked at him earnestly, and he could see pain in his eyes and something leaner. Sorrow, maybe, regret, or some... Ragged woe tattered by years. His father twirled the bottle slowly with a thumb and two fingers. You won't make it forty miles, the kid said. You didn't walk here, did you? Well, I'll ride your horse. So it's my walk then. Jesus, kid, I'm dying. Where's your heart? 
He turned from his father and looked out across the slick black of the water. All right, his father said. You won't do it. The kid slapped at the table with one hand. He stood up and there was silence behind him as everyone stopped their talk to watch. He shook his head and rubbed at his chin with one hand. His father sat leaned forward with his elbows on his knees and lit another smoke. There's things need saying, he said. He said it flatly, looking down at his shoes. Why, so you can feel better? I was thinking about you. You never thought of me before. I did so. Yeah, right. He reached out and took the bottle off the table and held it up and studied the level of it, sniffing at the top of it before setting it back down and kicking at his father's chair. His father raised his head slowly and peered at him sideways. The kid sat down. I need you to bury me facing east, he said, sitting up in the warrior way. You ain't no warrior. His father sat and sucked the smoke between the pinched ends of his fingers, then tossed it over the railing. He stood and reached out and took the bottle and raised it to his mouth and swallowed twice, hard. And then he pitched the bottle over the railing, too. He turned to the kid and he weaved some but put a hand down on the tabletop to steady himself and looked at his son with half-closed eyes. I was once, he said. Need to tell you about that. Need to tell you a lot of things. So you want to walk and talk about the good old days? Weren't no good old days. But you need to hear still. It's all I got to give you. Ain't never gonna be enough. He looked at the kid, and there was no more talk. So he turned and made his way across the deck and through the door into the bar room. The men at the other tables watched him go. They looked at the kid. He sat with his feet propped on the chair his father had just occupied and rolled a smoke. When he was finished, he set it between his lips and held it there without lighting it, content to stare away across the water to the black hulk of the mountain. You've just heard Medicine Walk by Indigenous Canadian author Richard Wagamese. If you want to listen to another unconventional mountain text, tune in for Denise at Desautel's Sculptures, 2005, which brings a unique perspective on Montreal. If you prefer English and happen to love dark comedy, then Mia Van Leeuwen's reading from Angie Abdu's The Canterbury Trail will be perfect. <laughs>